Well, thank you, Minister, for that address. You've covered a lot of ground. She raises a lot of questions. Um, we only have half an hour, so I'm going to jump straight in. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I think uh, relating to a lot of the issues that you raised, there are some economists, quite a few actually, who believe that Singapore's economic model needs to change. Well, for example, um, with the, the rise of reshoring, the backlash against globalization, um, and the coming of a global minimum tax, they point out that maybe we need to rely much less on multinational corporations than we have in the past. We also have to, we have to shift focus more to the region, not only serving global markets. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to rely less on foreign workers, especially at the blue collar level. Um, on the social side, you mentioned the, uh, the a aging, which will, uh, which will require increases in health spending. You mentioned inequality, uh, which might get worse as we move to a knowledge economy with more automation and digitization, mm. which would call for an expansion of social safety nets. So putting it all together, uh, do you think economic, Singapore's economic model needs to change and adapt? Well, Vikram, I would say this, that our economic model has never been static. It has continually been evolving and changing. You know, I started work as an economist in 1997. And one of my first work responsibilities was to run the economic models in MTI, okay. to provide the economic forecast. It was very good exposure for a young economist because you get to know the ins and outs of uh, the, how the economy operates. But today's economy is very different from the one in 1997. All the things that you talked about, the balance between global and region, the balance between MNCs and local enterprises, the push for greater productivity, the strengthening of our social safety nets, all these have happened over the years and they continue to evolve. I think for that, for, for that matter about how the mix of industries has shifted. Um, just five years ago, you would never have thought of Singapore as having an agriculture sector or doing automobile manufacturing. Now we have ag tech, agriculture tech. We have EV manufacturing in Singapore. And these are not accidental outcomes. And these are the, out, the result of us systematically reviewing, transforming the economy sector by sector. And we've been doing this through our industry transformation maps, looking at each individual sector, identifying the trends, looking over the horizon at new opportunities and growing the sector by bringing in new investments and also growing our own timber. And importantly, all of this is done also with a recognition that Singaporeans need to be equipped with the skill sets to thrive amidst these changes. It can be very unsettling to workers and professionals uh, when the economy is continuing to change and restructure and churn at such a rapid pace. For a young graduate, a new entrant to the workforce, maybe it's not so difficult because they would get you know, the relevant training from school but for someone in their 40s and 50s, it is not easy. And that's why we are putting in significant investments into this whole, um, you know, talking about skills upgrading and lifelong learning. We are putting significant investments into skills future. It's, it's not just a slogan or, um, you know, it's not just a, something we say for political communication. It is real investments, real programs, and a massive infusion of skills at every stage of one's career. And we are doing this in probably at a scale that is larger than I think what many other country, any other country is doing in Singapore. So, so we are doing all of these and it all amounts to a continued change in our economic model. So it's a, it's a dynamic model. It's, it, 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 it will keep changing as, I'm sure. as circumstances. I'm sure. Okay. Uh, can we switch to some of the other issues you mentioned, population mm -hmm. and aging? Okay, we rec recently learned that Singapore's population has declined by about 4.1% here. 
mainly because of the fall in the non-resident population due to COVID, but significantly even the citizen and resident population has gone down. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned aging, where we have, mm -hmm. um, uh, which is accelerating. Uh, I think that you, you mentioned there were 9% uh, 65 plus year olds in 2020, and actually the latest figure is 17.6%. Yes. And going up to more than 25%. Exactly. So, so, so the working age population is not going to grow. Mm -hmm. What that means is that we have to rely more on productivity. Absolutely. For growth. Absolutely. But if we look back, our productivity growth has been disappointing over the no, last 10 years. Not too bad. One point made some progress. 1.5 to 1.8. Mm -hmm. But that won't be enough to, to, to fund the sort of social programs, the ambitious social mm -hmm. programs that you laid out. Uh, so what can we do to raise the growth rate? And is increasing the number of people in the working population, is that off the table? No, we keep trying. Okay. I think we never stop trying, uh, but it's not easy. I don't know of many advanced countries that have been able to overcome this challenge, but we should not let up on our efforts there. But I would say even with productivity, it's, it's a con it, we are making progress. Um, nothing to sniff about, you know, the improvements we have made. And in some areas, extremely difficult. Uh, construction is one that we have been talking about for years, but it's been extremely hard to change some of the uh, existing processes, which tend to be more manual intensive. So it's a continued effort. We do see improvements, but we're going to double down. We're going to redouble our efforts to improve productivity. That's key. But the other part of it is that we must remain open and to be able to attract talent and people into Singapore to top up our own population. That's something we've talked about before. In fact, we had a very long debate on this in Parliament yeah. uh, recently, yeah. extended well in past midnight. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that the ability to stay open as an economy and as a society is going to be existential. It's extremely important that we do so. But we should recognize that there are downsides to being an open economy. I mentioned about this, I mentioned this in my speech in Parliament. There are downsides like um, the concerns that people have about jobs, about competition, about being displaced, about unfair practices at the workplace. And so we have to deal decisively with these downsides so that there is continued public trust in our system, and we can sustain an open economy model for as long as we can. Right. My apologies, I have to keep looking at the iPad. No, there, no problem. There are already questions coming in, right? Um, okay, let me go to, okay, in relation to one of these questions which I will ask, uh, let's switch to fiscal issues. Sure. Okay. Now we have a budget deficit of about 11 billion, um, FY 2021, following a record deficit of almost 65 billion in FY 2020. We've also drawn down reserves to the tune of 53.4 50, mm -hmm. billion. That's right. Uh, yeah, and uh, you said in Parliament that the government is prepared to do even more if needed, which is reassuring. But it does raise this question, um, is it realistic to expect the government to be able to balance the budget? over its current term. And looking ahead at future spending, uh, do you think it might be prudent to revisit mm. the balanced budget policy that we have, which, re which will require a constitutional amendment, of course, but, but still. And I understand we have to be prudent, but we also have to be realistic. Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. what do you think? Do you think we should revisit that balanced budget rule? Well, I would say this balanced budget rule enshrined in our constitution yep. instills discipline in the way we think about our spending. And we should never, never compromise on that basic fiscal discipline. Once you lose it, and we've seen these, I mean, we're not just talking about abstract examples. You see this happen in countries everywhere. Once you lose that discipline, there is no turning back. And that's why in many advanced countries, 
you see rising deficits and debt. It doesn't get better. So I would have a care about going down the path of uh, saying it's okay, let's just allow some relaxation. In, in any case, the balanced budget rule does not preclude us in government from undertaking counter-cyclical spending or crisis spending in an emergency. And, and in such an emergency scenario, we have the ability to draw on the fiscal firepower of our reserves, as we have done, of course, subject to the President's agreement. So it's, I think it's a sound system that allows for, that instills a culture of fiscal responsibility and stewardship and still enables us to spend when the need arises. Right. So the, the short answer is, uh, no, you're, you're not going to revisit the balanced budget. Right? I think that's something we, 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 nothing is ever off the table. Okay. And we continue to revisit you know, all, all, all our policies, but I think there are good reasons for us to keep this rule for now. Okay, a question from, from the audience. Uh, you, you said you're examining a wealth tax. And so what are, the, what are the issues you're looking at there? Because we already have, as you mentioned, a property tax. We already have stamp duties. Mm -hmm. uh, even if you raise them, I don't know if they'll move the needle much on revenue. Uh, and we, even estate duties, I don't think they have much revenue impact. So what could you look at in terms of a wealth tax that would, that would make the revenue position more resilient? Well, I shouldn't you know, talk about what we are thinking about okay. for the budget, but, okay. but as I said in my speech, we, we are studying what options there are to expand our system of wealth taxes. Mm -hmm. Whatever we do, we want to ensure, number one, that it is an effective way of taxation that um, you know, will allow us to, or, or will, will not have, um, e e that will not be easily avoided. Mm -hmm. Because one of the big challenges or the practical issues with any form of wealth tax is that wealth is mobile and it can be easily avoided. So that's one issue we have to think about. Yes. Second, uh, I think we want to make sure that while we address progressivity concerns, mm -hmm. we do not undermine our overall competitiveness. Because wealth is mobile, talent and wealth can move to other places. So we have to consider that very carefully. And then, of course, when we put in place or what, any new revenue measures, we want to ensure they add to our overall revenue resilience. So those are the considerations we have, and we continue to think about this, study whether there are possibilities to make our system of wealth taxes even better. Okay, very good. There's an interesting question here from somebody, and it says, would you agree that another challenge is to make Singaporeans more risk-taking? That we are a very risk-averse society, and you know, in an age of innovation, we need to take more risks. And what can we do to make people, in entrepreneurs especially, take more risk? I invent on that. You know, I think the situation today is quite different from, say, 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. Because when I think about, when I meet university students these days, I see a lot of excitement, a lot of enthusiasm to you know, to do startups, to get involved in entrepreneurship projects. Very different from when I was in school. Mm. Okay. Very, very different. Um, and the students have many opportunities for overseas exposure. They go to different cities and, you know, they start projects there. They come back, they start projects in Singapore. And clearly the startup space in Singapore today it's a lot more vibrant than it used to be 10 years ago. A lot more vibrant. So I would say, yes, we must continue to promote risk-taking, entrepreneurship, innovation, but let's not trivialize the progress we've made. Uh, real concrete progress. And 
And so we are moving in the right direction and we will continue to encourage risk-taking. Sometimes, of course, encouraging risk-taking also goes back to what is the role of the state. And, and you see, this is always a tension, right? Because the same people who talk about promoting risk-taking often also ask for the government to do more. Yep. And, you know, these are tensions because the more the government does, in some ways, you increase state dependency. So we always have to find the right balance. Yes, we want to do more in government. We want to spend more to provide a better system of opportunity, security, to give assurance to every Singaporean to cope with life's uncertainties. But we also need to value the role of the community and the role of the individual. There is a part for all of us to play. Right. Okay, but the government, I mean, there is also this the stigma of bankruptcy, which mm. is partly a policy issue and partly a cultural, social issue. I mean, that, that may be that inhibits uh, risk taking to some extent. Mm. Do, do you think we need to do more on that to destigmatize we should. bankruptcy and we failure? Should. Which is we should. Yeah. And, and again, better than before. Yeah. I mean, no entrepreneur <clears throat> can be a success without having gone through multiple failures. That's a fact. And, and I think more and more we are show, highlighting this, but sometimes the media tends to focus only on the success stories, but you know, we don't talk about the failures that one has gone through in life before reaching mm -hmm. that success. So we should highlight all of these. And I, I think, again, we, we, we are making progress, but still there's more to be done. There are several questions on inequality. Uh, and somebody's asked about inheritance tax, estate duties, and whether we need more of that. But let me broaden the question. Um, as, as we automate and digitize faster, I think you, know, you, you might see more and more inequality in, in a knowledge economy. We also have a growing gig economy. Yes. These are workers with unstable incomes. Mm -hmm insecure jobs um, and so and this raises the issue of the social safety nets especially for those laid off or fall between the cracks as far as our unemployment related social safety nets are concerned we have a quite ad hoc policy where we, we from time to time periodically we, we, we do support uh, the unemployed on a, a, on a time bound basis with qualification criteria mm -hmm. So do you think we need to move towards a more automatic system, uh, more like a regular unemployment insurance scheme in that direction, given the, the, the uncertainties ahead and the inequalities that might arise and the possible, you know, the, the layoff uh, periods that may accelerate as well? Yeah, sure. A, a few parts to what you highlighted on gig workers. That's something that we are concerned about, okay. particularly gig workers who have uh, an employer-employee relationship with platforms uh, like your delivery riders, your uh, private hire car drivers. Um, they currently, many of them, do not have CPF. They do not benefit from employer CPF. So issues about you know, retirement adequacy, these sorts of issues do arise. And that's why Prime Minister announced in the National Day rally earlier this year that we are looking at uh, advisory group to, you know, through the tripartite um, network to see what ways we can do to mm -hmm. um, look out for these gig workers and what changes we might make. So that's one group that we are watching out for closely. On the system of unemployment or helping un people who are displaced and, and unemployed in a more systematic manner. We are putting in more schemes now. For example, we now have a COVID recovery grant. Of course, yes, it's only for the pandemic, but it does provide some help. But more importantly, besides, in, you know, it's not just about the grants that we provide, but we put in place a lot of effort to do what we call active labour market facilitation, training, new skills, and then matching to the jobs that are available. 
tremendous effort that's done there. So that's the system we have put in place. Some help, coupled with very active labour market facilitation to ensure that anyone who is displaced can get skills upgrading and can find a job as soon as possible. We continue to review these schemes to see how they can be enhanced. But it's something that we are looking at very carefully. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, back to the fiscal side, there's another question from the audience. Uh, say the BEPS framework, BEPS, uh, mm -hmm. Base Erosion Profit Shifting Framework, you mentioned in your, in your speech, it may make Singapore's tax incentives less effective mm -hmm. for multinationals. Uh, so what are multinationals asking for in response to these new rules? Well, tax incentives are just one of several reasons why an MNC would want to come to Singapore. And it's not just because of tax. Sure. Right? We have many other non-tax factors. The quality of our workforce, overall ease of doing business in Singapore, rule of law, intellectual property. Uh, all of these are very strong competitive reasons why we are able to attract investments. So with BEPS 2.0, obviously tax incentives become less, of a, less salient. But we, we, we need to therefore strengthen our non-tax factors and, and compete on all of these other um, you know, capabilities that will ensure that we are able to attract our fair share of investments. So that's something we will continue to work on, strengthening our non-tax competitiveness uh, factors. The second area that we, were, we are looking at is with BEPS 2.0, uh, we must always preserve our tax sovereignty rights. So if indeed international, international taxation rules change, we will update our corporate tax system accordingly to be in line with these new international norms. And so long as this is done on a level playing field. All countries adopt this. Fine, we will go along with that approach. Doing so may give us some additional revenue from our corporate, through, our, uh, through changes in our corporate tax system. And if we do get additional revenue from that, we will plow it back to up the upgrading or improving the capabilities of our workers, of our economy, so that we can remain competitive in this new BEPS 2.0 world. Right, right. Okay, still on, on the fiscal issues, there's another question uh, on the timing of the GST increase. Now we have inflation flaring mm -hmm. up. I mean, yesterday the MAS uh, already tightened monetary policy. Your inflation is running at 5% in the US, 4% in Germany. And it's not, it looks like it's not gonna go away in a hurry. So we are is, watching it very carefully. Right. So how does that influence the timing of the GST hike? Well, the government has already said, stated its position very clearly. Uh, we will need the GST increase you know, between 2022 and 2025, probably sooner rather than later. And we will consider the overall economic outlook, including uh, the outlook on inflation when we... Um, eventually decide on the actual timing of this move. But I, you know, I think we also need to recognize that the GST, as I mentioned in my speech, comes with an offset package and comes with permanent GST vouchers. For the offset package, which we call the assurance package, we have already set aside monies for this assurance package. Money is there. So when GST is introduced, we will, it will come along with the assurance package, which will effectively delay the GST increase by about five years for majority of Singaporeans. Mm. And for the lower income Singaporeans, it will delay the GST increase effectively by 10 years. You know, so when you look at that, then you appreciate that it's not, 
you know, the GST move shouldn't be looked in isolation. It must come along with the offset package. And importantly, besides this offset package, we are also going to enhance the permanent GST voucher scheme. Uh, question here on something that is quite current that is going on. Is the government concerned about rising supply chain disruption and the potential for inflation? Is there any possibility of policy changes going forward? Let's talk about the supply chain disruption, which, which looks, looks to be quite serious, and many of our companies depend on that. What should companies be doing to respond to this? It's, it's an issue. Uh, we saw this last year when there was a scramble for essential medical supplies. Right. And this has continued this year with you know, different you know, persistent supply chain bottlenecks have continued this year. I think it, it means that companies you know, everywhere have to start thinking about inventories and supply chains and having you know, uh, more resilient systems. It's no longer just about just in time. Because if you're just operating on very thin buffers and there is a disruption, yeah. your whole operations may be impacted. Right. So think about diversification. Think about where you might be highly re reliant on a particular location or a particular source country. And think about how you might have a few more you know, options in case something were to go wrong. I think that's something that companies everywhere are already starting to think about. Yeah. Uh, and so in government, MTI today is now also starting to engage companies in this exercise right. to start thinking about their supply chains, mm. where they might be vulnerable, and what sorts of um, insurance they might want to buy. Right. Right? Purely from a commercial basis, right. because this is something that all companies should be thinking about from a business continuity point of view. From the government's point of view, what should we be thinking about? We will look at essential supplies. And for essential supplies, we will look at diversification, but we also have the option of building stockpiles, which we do today for things like rice and you know, other essential supplies. So those are things that the government can do but companies should do their part too yeah. and see how they can you know, improve their supply chains, make it more resilient, and, and ensure business continuity in this new volatile world. Right. Okay, uh, our timekeepers have said there's five minutes left. They said it about three minutes ago. So this, so this has to be, I think, the last question. Sure. Um, and on climate energy, um, which another issue you you, you went into in your speech. Now, Singapore is quite heavily invested in the fossil fuels industry. We have a sizable offshore sector. We have huge petrochemical plants. Uh, Jurong Island is basically a fossil fuels uh, island. Um, so do you think a lot of these operations are vulnerable to be disrupted as we accelerate the shift to renewables? And should we be trying to phase out investments in the fossil fuel sector? The investments in refining and uh, petrochemicals, these were made years ago, yeah. you know, before climate change even came to the fore. Yeah. And they have served us well, create many good jobs for Singaporeans. I think it will be very hard to change overnight. But to be fair to the companies in these sectors, they are committed to being best in class when it comes to energy efficiency. And these companies are not just serving the Singapore market, they're serving the region and the world. Right. And to the extent that there is demand for the products and the services, I think then you would have plant, you know, these plants will exist somewhere in the world. And if, if, they, do, if they are here in Singapore, we want them to be highly efficient. And that's what's happening now. But I also have no doubt that as we raise our carbon price, which we will do, as I mentioned just now, over time, you know, companies will see the internalize the carbon price and our industry mix will shift over time. I have no doubt this, this will happen. 
the market will sort of reflect that shift because there is a, a carbon price. Investment decisions will start to play out accordingly. I think what's more challenging for us in Singapore in making this green transition is not our industry mix. Like I said, industry mix will evolve. I think it's how we can decarbonize our fuel mix, our, our power. Mm. How can we get green power? It's a very challenging issue, extremely challenging, because we can't scale up renewable power in Singapore. It's, we don't have the ability to. So what options are there for base load power? What, what options do we have? Um, with, it's something that we are studying very carefully. Uh, the most promising options today are green hydrogen and carbon capture. But these technologies are not available for immediate deployment. Maybe post-2030. Right? Maybe. So we are in, that's why we are investing heavily in R&D in these technologies, to better understand the options we have and to put ourselves in a strong position to make this green transition. Importing green electricity can help, but surely we don't want to import 100% of our electricity. I mean, there are limits to importing power. I mean, there are technical issues, there are energy security issues as well. Yeah. So with the combination of green imports, carbon markets, we can buy carbon credits, mm -hmm. and finally, some form of new technological solution that will allow us to decarbonize our base load power generation. I think those are the three keys in enabling us to decarbonize our economy. Um, in the longer term. Right. Very good, uh, Mr. Minister. Thank you for your candor in answering a wide-ranging set of questions. I wish we could go on, but I'm afraid we're out of time. So thank you for making the time for this. Thank you, Vikram. Thank you. Good talking to you. Likewise. Thank you.